Hi, this is Anthony. Welcome back to my show. I'm going to give some information about nonprofit board composition because there's a lot of controversy over the Aftermath Foundation having three married couples on it and people's belief that they ganged up on Aaron Smith Levin. But before I get to that, I want to address a few related issues that have come up, especially in the comments to my videos. While many commenters have expressed support for Aaron, almost total support for him, and almost total opposition to the remaining board members of the Aftermath Foundation, which I don't necessarily agree with those sentiments. I think overall the various parties are starting to move on and are focusing on their own personal businesses, resuming the type of YouTube content that they've traditionally have posted, and overall continuing to help people transition out of Scientology. And I think that if you watch these different channels, or you have in the past, unless you're OSA, you probably believe in that mission, helping people escape or get settled outside of Scientology. So let's just cheer on everyone who's helping to work for those ends. I've gotten at least one comment about the tone of my voice that the viewer wasn't happy with. I'll tell you that my voice to me when I speak, like many people's, seems completely normal. However, when I hear it played back after being recorded, I sometimes cringe. Whether you believe me or not, I'm generally not trying to modulate my voice in any way to sound superior or to turn anyone against Aaron or anyone else. I will admit that I have very limited editing skills, and so generally I have to do these videos in one continuous take, and I'm generally reading from a script that I've prepared so that I don't miss anything. Because sometimes when you're dealing with very specific subjects, leaving out a word or a concept can change the meaning of what you're talking about, or at least make it not as clear. So hopefully not too many people are upset by the tone of my voice. I've had a couple people leave negative comments about me mentioning my background in board service. I bring these up not to toot my own horn, but if you're going to invest your time in listening to somebody talk about the intricacies of nonprofit boards or the culture of nonprofit or government committees in general, shouldn't the person who's giving information, in this case me, be somebody that has some background and knowledge about what they're talking about? Anybody can have an opinion about what the Aftermath Foundation Board should have done, but if you don't know much about bylaws in general, if you don't know anything about government regulations of nonprofits and foundations, if you haven't bothered to look up any of these filings that the Aftermath Foundation has filed with the state of Texas or the state of Florida, if you haven't bothered to watch the few videos put out by both sides that discuss their perspectives, then do you really have the knowledge and background to offer an opinion that holds any merit or to make a decision on whether you should continue subscribing, watching, and or funding one or more of these parties? So, if you think that I'm bragging and that I have no relevant experience, nobody's forcing you to watch my videos, although I do appreciate that you do. But I will continue from time to time to point out why I think that I, that what I have to say may have some merit based on actual experience rather than the opinion coming from a hairy creature dwelling underneath a bridge out in the woods. Okay, so now I'll talk about what are considered to be the legal requirements for different types of foundations. And what I'll read to you comes from the website of a business called The Foundation Group, which seems to be a commercial business which facilitates the creation of foundations and other types of nonprofits for people. Now, I have no doubt that what they say is probably accurate, but unfortunately they don't cite the actual regulations or links to where they got that information. For instance, they may state that the IRS has, a poli has this policy, but they don't tell what the policy number is so that you can verify it with the IRS. And therefore I found this particular website, or before I found this particular website, I was looking for online sources that had actual IRS policies with a case number or ruling number or some other type of actual tax code number, but I couldn't find any. And I did try using BARD AI, which can be hit or miss. It originally flashed up on the screen some information and then it deleted it and then put new information, which seemed to contradict what they originally had put up. A lot of what they put up in their final response to my question is similar to the information that I'll provide after this. Uh, I'll read now from their question and answer page. So it starts, related members on a nonprofit board of directors. There are a few questions we deal with more than this one. This is, how do you deal with related 
members on your nonprofit's board of directors. Let's start by defining what is technically meant by related. Definition. For IRS purposes, relationship among board members is narrowly defined, typically confined to blood, marriage, or outside business connection. Each of these has limitations also. Blood relations are family members extending to mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter, and grandmother or grandfather. Once it gets to aunts, uncles, and or cousins, you're probably beyond the strict definition of blood related. Marriage relations could include spouse, son or daughter-in-law, and mother or father-in-law. With regard to business, two or more business partners serving on the board while collectively owning 35% or more of a for-profit company are considered related, as are co-workers who have a superior subordinate relationship at the company they work for. Former spouses are not considered to be related. Why it matters. The IRS considers related board members to not be completely independent. Even if the people in question believe that they are not subject to influence by virtue of that relationship, the IRS doesn't buy it. They consider it to be a conflict of interest that impacts the charity. As such, there are strict rules with regard to nonprofit governance where related board members are involved. These rules vary greatly depending upon whether the nonprofit is a public charity or a private foundation. Public charity. Public charities are the most common 501c3 organizations. They are also the nonprofits that the IRS is most concerned about board composition. The IRS requires that public charities have at least 51% of the voting members of the board of directors to be unrelated. Beyond the simple majority, it is also important that the organization is able to form a quorum of majority unrelated directors in order to conduct an official board meeting. To put that in perspective, if a nonprofit board has four or seven board members, two of whom are married, the overall balance is okay. But if only four directors can attend a board meeting and two of the four are the related directors, a quorum hasn't been reached. A question we often get involves, for example, two married couples being a board, but neither couple is connected to the other by relationship. Both individuals in each marriage are related, obviously, but the relationships are considered separately, not collectively. For example, if a board meeting is held with seven directors, including both couples, you still have an acceptable balance because there is no relationship connection between the four people. We are often asked for the specific Internal Revenue Code rule that directly and specifically prohibits majority-related public charity boards. Often to the frustration of the asker, we cannot. This principle is one of the many IRS regulations that are extrapolated from another rule. Being classified as a public charity is a preferential status level of a 501c3 that brings with it the highest level of donor tax deductibility allowed. In exchange, the IRS requires that the board of the organization be free of private benefit or inurement and governed at arm's length from the personal interest of those doing the governing. While it may not be chapter and verse quotable, the IRS consistently interprets public charity boards with more than half of its members related to one another as being in violation of the inurement prohibition. This is demonstrated in revenue rulings, revenue procedures, court cases, and everyday regulatory administration. Private foundations. The rules are quite different for foundations, though no less restrictive, because private foundations are not considered publicly supported. There are no limits on board composition, even allowing for an entire board to be members of one family. You often see this with family foundations, but there are trade-offs. The IRS makes it much more difficult for board members of a foundation to be compensated as employees compared to a public charity. It can be done, but the rules are strict and penalties for getting outside those rules are steep. Okay, 
that's the end of what they have to say. So the rest of this is going to be my own comments. I'm going to wrap this video up shortly, but I wanted to bring up some thoughts. Lots of people, particularly those on Aaron's side, point to the Aftermath Foundation having three married couples on the board of directors as being a bad, if not sinister thing. As I pointed out in a number of my videos, I agree that the optics of that certainly doesn't help how the foundation is perceived by much of the public. Is it legal? Possibly. Is it ethical? It could well be. But let's think about this. In one of Aaron's videos, he insinuated that it was he and Luis Garcia who were the two founders of the Aftermath Foundation, that he's the one who named it. Of course, he admitted that it was named after Leah Remini's show that she did with Mike Rinder. Now, from the video that Claire Headley posted, she indicated that the founders, the original founders of the Aftermath Foundation, were Aaron, Louise, Mark and Claire Headley, and Mike Rinder and his wife, Christy Colbran. She may have also mentioned that Ray Jeffrey was a member or a founder. I don't remember. I watched the video yesterday, and I don't want to go back and check it on that detail right now. And then I think most people know that once Luis left the board, that Amy Scobie and her spouse joined it recently. So let's think about that. Let us assume that Aaron was one of the two co-founders, and he obviously, in conjunction with Luis, asked those two couples, the Renders and the Headleys, to join his board. If having multiple married couples on the board is a bad idea now, why did he invite them back in 2017? If he, in fact, was not at all one or not one of the only two co-founders, but all six or seven of them came together to create the foundation simultaneously, the same thing holds. Why didn't he think it was a bad idea to have two couples on the board at the same time? And I'm not sure if Aaron has ever publicly complained about the board having three married couples on it. That doesn't seem like his beef with the board. So if Aaron doesn't seem to have a problem with one or more couples being on the board that he founded or co-created in some way, then perhaps the rest of us should not be too bothered by it. Now, if anybody has seen a video where Aaron has brought up that uh, he has a problem with uh, multiple married couples being on the board, then I would stand corrected. I would love to be given the link and timestamp in the comment section of the video here about any uh, videos that he may have talked about that. And I've had lots of comments that I'm sure a month ago that uh, people a month ago loved Claire and Mark and they loved Mike and Christy, subscribed to their channels and watched all their videos. But now they're a bunch of backstabbers using their old Scientology methods. Is that really true? I think that you should try to put yourself in their position. Imagine that you are on a board and you have someone whose behavior is starting to cause problems. And Aaron has admitted that there was at least one incident in Los Angeles six months ago and he admitted that he and his wife have for a long time basically been separated. And if you look at some of the Church of Scientology's hate site on Aaron, it seems that they may have some pictures of him with the woman who's not his wife. I don't think that the issue that was brought this to a four um, is that there were a couple incidences where the police were called to bars where Aaron was in some type of altercation with people. I know that that's been brought up on the surface, but I don't think that that's truly at the heart of the matter. I think that there are multiple instances of various kinds of problematic behavior in his personal life and certain things that he said about other people in the ex-Scientology or anti-Scientology world that is causing a lot of headaches for the leadership of the Aftermath Foundation. When you're leading an organization like that, especially when you have a day job and a family, you need to be spending your time on the mission of the organization, not spending a lot of time putting out fires associated with a particular individual who is a board member. I think that the board was becoming slightly dysfunctional, and this certainly seems to be an issue that should have been internally worked through or perhaps a mediator brought in so that there could be a resolution to the issue where all parties could be fairly satisfied 
and happy and not just have these issues be made public, which has just caused lots of turmoil amongst the supporters of these various individuals and likely is causing a drop in donations to the Aftermath Foundation, which I think just about everybody who watches the SPTV videos supports the mission of. Okay, I think I'm going to stop here. There's a lot of dense information that I've talked about. Some of it can be quite dry, but I think for a lot of people, this is an important subject, and the important subjects often are very complex, and you need to really dive deep into the weeds to adequately understand some of the complexities that are involved. Again, I know a lot of you are not going to necessarily agree with me, but I think that we can still have a respectful conversation. Please leave your comments in the comments section if you haven't already. I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. And if you made it this far, even if you didn't totally like what I've said in this video, maybe you could hit the like button. And please do check out my other videos. I cover a wide range of topics. And even within the Scientology world, I have a few lighter hearted videos that you might be interested in that aren't quite as weighty as some of these. Thanks again and hope to hear from you soon.